Hey, you guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. We're going to be talking about Leilani Simon. Leilani Simon is the young mother from Georgia who back in October of 2022, she reported her 21 month son, Quentin Simon, missing. Um, she led the police kind of on like a wild goose chase, giving them all types of scenarios for what she believed may have happened to her young son from, oh, his biological dad came and got him in the middle of the night. Oh, he was kidnapped. I don't know. I woke up and the door was open. Maybe he just got out. All kind of things come to find out. Um, it is believed that something happened. She put him in a trash bag, threw him into the trash. And his little body ended up in a landfill. Um, the police did search the landfill. They found remains that were tested and did come out to be Quentin Simon. She has been arrested. She is currently in jail. And she is being charged with um, malice murder. Um, several counts of lying to the police. And she had a court hearing today. We're going to go over it. In this court hearing, I've come through some documents that really details what Quentin Simon's a little body went through after death, just simply due to the fact of the way that she disposed of his body, putting him in the trash. I have to say, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning. I'm gonna be reading off of a document that it was that is devastating to to see, to hear, and to think about um, in regards to what this little baby went through. So just know, trigger warning. I'm gonna go ahead and roll the intro, give YouTube time to send out those notifications, and then we're gonna get into it. Okay, guys, so, um, wow, Zuna. Zuna said a few hours ago, I was thinking if there was any updates on the Quentin Simon case, spooky. That is wild. She had court today. So let's go ahead, let's get into it. So first off, there were some motions that was filed um, that the judge could have um, ruled on, but she did not. So we're going to go over that, and then we're going to go over and we're going to read these documents because uh, I feel that it's necessary. Okay, so. Uh, Judge Tammy Stokes did not decide on any of the defense's three motions um, that was discussed today in court. So these three motions revolve around Leilani Simon's journals, um, whether or not they're going to throw out false statements that was made to law enforcement and the murder charges. Charges. So when Leilani came into the courtroom, she had her hair down, she was in jail attire, she had a mask covering her face, and she wore glasses. Now, let's let's get into the motions, okay? So two of the motions that was discussed today in court um, were in regards to Leilani's 19-count indictment. It says that Leilani faces more than a dozen counts of making false statements to the police, and the defense, they're saying they don't agree with four of those um, 19. Yeah, those four of the 19. The defense argued that Leilani cannot be charged with lying about if and where she may have thrown Quentin's body away or whether she was under the influence, which is really wild to me. Um, they're saying she can't be charged with lying about if she threw his body away and where she may have thrown his body away. If you guys hear the dog, I do apologize. My son has COVID, so he can't tend to the dog. So I have her out here with me today. Um, also, they don't agree with uh, her line about whether or not she was under the influence. Okay. The prosecutor, Tim Dean, said that Leilani agreed to talk to law enforcement, and she had a constitutional right to stay silent, but she chose not to. Instead, she chose to talk, but lie. Um, so they feel that she can be charged with lying to the police. Now, in a separate motion, the defense claims the counts of felony and malice murder are not, are not detailed enough um, because prosecutors say they don't know the exact cause of death for Quentin. So they're basically like, basically the defense, they're worried that more information could come out during the trial that they're not prepared for because they're like, how can y'all 
charge her with felony MLS murder if y'all don't even know the cause of death. So I don't know if they if they're worried that the cause of death could come out at court and they're not going to be prepared for what that cause of death is. Um, the defense is asking that the state re-indict Leilani. The prosecution did not agree with that and said the matter could come back up in an appeals process. Back in February, the defense filed a motion to quash a subpoena for journals, diaries, and other writings of Leilani's. However, Billy Joe, she did turn over several journals to the court. The state has responded to the motion to quash the subpoena, um, directly challenging the defense's stance. So documents filed by the state say that the subpoena isn't a de facto search warrant as the defense has claimed but rather may be the only proper method for state to obtain this material and that the subpoena is reasonable because the material is pertinent and irrelevant judge stokes says she will take the motions into consideration and will make a ruling later on all of these motions I don't know when later is. We wasn't given a date, but right now she's taking everything into consideration and she'll come back to it. Now, I want to go over these documents, okay? So let me do a share screen with you guys really quickly and you guys can see these documents. Now, there's some that we're not going to go over, which is this, Judge Stokes Standing Criminal Schedule of Discovery. We're not going to go over that. Hold on, let me see. We're going to go over um, the state's response, uh, the state's response to defendant's special demur, demur to the murder charges. Okay, and this is where it gets really upsetting okay so the defendant leilani is charged with murdering her 21 month old son quentin simon with concealing quentin's death by discarding his body in a dumpster the contents of which were then deposited at a local landfill while falsely reporting his disappearance as an abduction and with telling investigators a series of retreating lies moving from one lie to the next only as each lie become an intentable in the face of additional information uncovered by law enforcement. Because the ins and outs, you guys, be forewarned, okay? Be forewarned. That's not the real Blake Shelton. That's just a friend of mine that uses that name. Be forewarned, okay? It's about to really get upsetting. These papers are heartbreaking. If you don't want to think about what little Quentin went through, you might want to get off. It's really difficult, okay? Okay. Because the ins and outs of waste management are perhaps not most common knowledge, more specificity, specific, specificity, why can I not say that word? More specifically, I'm going to say specifically, as to what happened to Quentin after Leilani discarded him in the dumpster might be, might be illuminating. I think they meant to say might be illuminating. Hours after Leilani had discarded Quentin's body in the dumpster, the hydraulic fork of a front-loading garbage truck lifted up the dumpster and dumped, its, and dumped its contents, including Quentin, into a large box that, that constitutes the back of the truck. Then a powerful contractor built into the truck compacted the contents of the box. And that's what I talked about before. I said, you know, where I live, our garbage trucks have the, they have this compacting system. So they come through, they throw things in the back of the truck. And then every so often they have this thing. So here's the back of the truck and here's the garbage. And here's like the bottom of the truck that actually closes. It closes, it opens, they dump things in it. It closes, it opens, they dump things in it. Now on the tail of this thing, basically, there's this thing that comes out and it smushes things. It comp it compacts it. It smushes it up to the top, the front of that truck, to give it more room to get the most amount of garbage that they can. And that's what this truck had. 
This truck that little Quentin was placed into had a compacting system. And it was used after Quentin's body was put into it. Which is just terribly horrendous. This powerful compacting action is desirable so that trucks can collect as much garbage as possible before having to visit the landfill. Eventually, the truck disgorged its load at the trash basin of a local landfill. A trash, ba trash basin is a designated point at which all trucks entering the landfill dump their garbage. It is not the final destination for the garbage. Rather, it's more like a staging area. This is a reference publication for the General Service Administration says that the typical compaction rate Compaction ratio for a front loaded garbage truck is six to one. A bulldozer then shoveled or shoved the heap garbage some 300 feet from the trash basin to a sale. A sale is a designated area to which garbage heap at the trash basin is being routed at a given time. This is not a neat process. It requires repeated trips by the bulldozer and involves, in addition to shoving, some amount of spreading and smearing, and etc. Once at the sale, the garbage and Quentin were compacted by a roughly 50 ton machine that looks something like a steamroller, but the rollers are studded rather than smooth. So once he was taken to, you know, put in the garbage truck, smushed, taken to the landfill, dumped. Then with a bulldozer, bulldozer pushed to a designated area, right? Then once there, said bulldozer that has studs on them, has studs on them, it rolls over it, smushes it, smears it. Um, if anyone knows how to get a hold of Sherry, please tell them my Twitter shows no messages. Okay, Sherry's in the chat. She can see you. Thank you, Amanda. Then there was a search. Once law enforcement had identified the sale in which Quentin is likely to be located, they set about searching it. This process consisted of ex excavators scooping garbage out of the sale and loading it into dump trucks. The dump trucks then unloading the garbage to an open area known as the search deck. The garbage then was spread evenly onto um, the search deck. Law enforcement then painstakingly combed through the garbage. The garbage was cleared from the search deck, was made room for the next load. This process was repeated day after day, load after load, ton after ton, until these efforts finally met with grim success. All of which to say is that Quentin's body went through a lot. As a direct result of the defendant's deliberate choice, not only to conceal Quentin's death, but to do so specifically by su subjecting him to the violence of the waste management system. Law enforcement did not discover his remains, not his intact body, but his remains for more than a month after his disappearance. Naturally, Quentin's body had by then undergone severe trauma and decomposition. To be clear, it is not as though law enforcement found Quentin's remains in a single location on the search deck. Rather, they were dispersed across it. A bone here, a bit of tissue there. Quentin's cause of death, therefore, was not apparent from the, from the obviously, the observation of his remains. And while forensic analysis is ongoing, no cause of death has yet been ascertained forensically and likely will not ever be. Nor has any other evidence conclusively established Quentin's cause of death. No one saw the defendant murder Quentin. And the defendant's various statements to law, law enforcement and to news media outlets as to how Quentin came to be dead 
were an inscrutable and inculpatory mishmash of, I don't know, I don't remember, I don't think I would do anything to hurt him, but if I did, I would take responsibility. Thank you, Angela. The state of the evidence as to Quentin's cause of death then is the fault of the defendant and the defendant alone. Further, her actions in disposing of his body and concealing his whereabouts indicates that her specific intent and hope was that Quentin would never be found at all. And the idea seems to have been nobody, no case. Nobody, no case. Like her, in her mind, she thought, oh, they can't find his body. They don't have a case. You guys remember where they said that? Um, who said that? Like, I remember hearing them saying, like, oh, there's no way they would ever find his body because he was at the landfill. But listen, those that searched that landfill, they, they were determined. They were there on a mission, and they worked their butts off to do this. It is against this factual backdrop that the defendant now moves to quash her murder charges on the grounds that they purportedly contain insufficient information as to how exactly she killed Quentin. One marvels at the brazenness. Granting the defendant's special demur would be tantamount to telling the, the defendant and other would-be murderers, get rid of the body entirely or do a good enough job trying and the court will reward you, will reward, will reward your cunning and depravity by declaring you beyond the reach of prosecution for murder. In effect, the defendant asked the court to validate her actions by consummating her plan. Basically, like, I was longest, like, we shouldn't be able to charge her with murder because the body doesn't tell us exactly what killed him. I mean, common sense tells us that she disposed of him. If she disposed of him, she must have been the one that killed him. But if we're going to go with the nobody, you know, no conviction, or if you can't understand how they pass, or if th there's no clear cause of death, then, then we are basically telling potential murderers, just do a well enough job at getting rid of the body or ruining the body to the point where they can't exactly say how they died. Then you won't have to worry about it. That's what they're saying in here. Fortunately, that is not how this works. Under Georgia law, an indictment is not required to include any more specifics than the evidence, which again was shaped by the defendant. In this calculation, she appears to have underestimated the perseverance, commitment, and competency and competence of the multi-agency law enforcement team that undertook this investigation. Even this is not an accurate reflection of the law. Upholding conviction in a no-body murder case. The indictment in this case is proper given the information available to the state. It's properly given the information available to the state. So the court should reject the defendant's gambite. Is that gambite? Is that how you say that? First, the defendant argues that the three murder charges are deficient for not specifying Quentin's cause of death. However, it has long been the law that an indictment failing to specify the cause of death is, in, is sufficient when the circumstances of the case will not admit of greater certainty, certainty in stating the means of death. Which, okay, so they, they state the law, which itself itself quoted a Massachusetts case from 1850 for the proposi this proposition. This is a sensible ruling because the state cannot be more specific than the evidence permits. State versus white, inter internal citation omitted. See also Hinton versus state. Applying this concept in the context of a nobody murder case. Second, the defendant argues, girl, you better not poop in here. I just took you outside. The defendant argues that count three felony murder predicted on felony murder predicted 
on cruelty to children in the first degree is deficient for not specifying the manner in which the defendant caused Quentin's cruel and excessive physical harm. However, here again, the state cannot be more specific than the evidence permits. In demanding more specific information that the state can allege in light of her actions, the defendant cites Stinson versus State for the following propositions. In order to satisfy due process, when an indictment charges a compound felony, such as felony murder, the count charging the compound offense must contain the essential element of the predicate offense. Or the indictment must contain a separate count charging the, the predicate offense, predicate or predicate, predicate offense completely, or the indictment must elsewhere allege facts showing how the compound offense was committed. But this rule is phrased in the disjunctive. An indictment that takes any one of the three listed approaches is sufficient to satisfy due process. Here, the felony murder count contains the essential elements of the predicate offense. In the end, the true test of the sufficiency of an indictment to withstand a special demur is not whether it could have been more definite and certain, but whether it contains the elements of the offense intended to be charged and sufficiently apprises the defendant of what he must be prepared to meet. And in any case, any other proceedings are taken against him for similar offenses. Whether the record shows with accuracy to what extent she may plead a formal acquittal or conviction. Now, White at 260, internal citation and punctuation omitted. Here, the murder charges put the defendant on notice that the state intends to prove that she intentionally killed Quentin, which is count one malice murder. That even if she did not specifically intend to kill, that even if she did not specifically intend to kill Quentin, she nevertheless did kill him by way of an aggravated assault with an object that caused him serious bodily harm. Count two, felony murder, predicate on aggravated assault. In that, in the course of causing his death, she caused him cruel and excessive physical pain. Poor baby. Count three, felony murder predicated on cruelty to children. Under the circumstances of this case and under the law, nothing more is required. The state notes that under Georgia law, the meaning of the word object in this context is broad. Examples of normally non-offensive deadly objects, which is being used in the manner as to support convictions of aggravated assault or a beer bottle, a ceramic statue, a pocket knife, a pocket knife, a fist, and even a pillow and sheets. Hands when used to strangle, hands and feet when used to strike, a pillow when used to smother. Furthermore, this responsive filing is itself sufficient to resolve the issue. There is no requirement that the state presents evidence to overcome a special demur of this nature. As Justice Namas explained in White, White also argues that if the state contends that certain facts are unknown, it must support those contentions with evidence at a pretrial hearing. The only way for the state to truly prove that it cannot specify certain facts would be to present all of the evidence the state has in order to show that the evidence does not allow it. That is, to make a full presentation of the state's evidence before actually trying the case. Nothing in our case, nothing in our cases dealing with material elements that are alleged to be unknown has indicated that we would impose such an impractical, impractical requirement. What you got? Okay, you can play with that. See Gardner versus State, um, not requiring a pretrial evidentiary hearing in an aggravated assault case where the weapon used was alleged, alleged to be unknown. Um, Johnson versus State, same where the indictment alleged that the cause of death was unknown. 
Phillips, same, moreover, a requirement of pretrial proof would contradict the principle that in reviewing demurs, the alleged in the indictment are taken as true, which would include an allegation that a matter was known to and thus unable to be specified by the grand jury. Lowe versus State, explaining that the court must take the allegations in an indictment as true when evaluating a demur. Miller versus State, the sufficiency of the facts before the grand jury to justify the charges in the indictment cannot be questioned, and the recitals concerning knowledge or want of knowledge of the names of the parties or other matters must be accepted as true. Respectfully submitted on the 14th day of July, 2023. Certificate of service. So it says it was served. Now, this is the state's response to the general demur to certain of the false statement charges. Okay. In count 10, 12, 14, and 17, the defendant is charged with violating OCGA 16 10 20 by knowingly and willfully concealing material facts from law enforcement during a series of interviews. The defendant argues that these charges violate her Fifth Amendment right against, against compelled self-incrimination because to have revealed because to have revealed the material facts at issue would have been admitted would have been to admit to criminal acts, which she had a right not to do. I've realized in reading some of these, I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of mistakes. And it's throwing my reading off. I do apologize. Okay, so basically she's saying. She has a Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate herself, right? Um, so it violated her right to not self-incriminate. But she decided to do that. They asked, you know, she didn't have to answer any questions. She chose to do that. It is true that all Americans enjoy the right to decline to speak to law enforcement and may invoke this right at any time during an interview. Contrary to the defendant's sweeping assertion, however, OCGA 161020 does not offend this right by imposing a general duty to reveal information during a criminal investigation. Rather, as our Supreme Court has recognized, this law is modeled on the longstanding federal false statement statute, which criminalizes only affirmative false statements and concealment of material facts to design to deceive and harm law enforcement government functions. Snyderman versus state, these statutes criminalize not passive non-disclosure, but a joint operation of an act or omission to act and intentions. Definitions of a crime, which OCGA 1621. There is no different, th this is no different from any other criminal offense. I'm so confused. The defendant cites no authority for the proposition that the Fifth Amendment affords criminal suspects the right, once they have chosen to, chosen to talk, to knowingly and wrongfully conceal material facts when asked questions that reasonably call for those facts to be revealed. I think, and I could be wrong, but I think what they're saying here is like, she has a right to not incriminate herself, so therefore, she had to lie to not do so. I think that's what they're saying. If I'm not getting that rec correctly, somebody correct me. To the contrary, the United States Supreme Court squarely rejects this theory in Brogan versus United States, which represented the question whether there is an exception to criminal liability under the Rule 18 U.S.C. 1001 for a false statement that consists of a denial of wrongdoing, the so-called ex explanatory no. In response to Brogan's argument that construing the statute as criminalizing false explanatory statements violates the spirit of the Fifth Amendment because it places a cornered suspect in the cruel trilemma of admitting guilt, remaining silent, or falsely denying guilt. At 404, the court explained as follows. This trilemma is wholly, is wholly of the guilty suspect's own making, of course. An innocent person will not find himself in a similar quandary. 
as one commentator has put it. The innocent person lacks even a lemma. <laughs> and even the honest and contrite guilty person will not regard the third prong of the trial lemma, the blatant lies, as an, as an available option. Whether or not the predicament of the wrongdoer runs to ground tugs at the heartstrings, neither the text nor the spirit of the Fifth Amendment confers a privilege to lie. Proper invocation of the Fifth Amendment privilege against compulsory self-incrimination allows a witness to remain silent, but not to swear falsely. Finally, a note on as-applied challenges an as-applied challenge, an opposal to a facial challenge, addresses whether a statute is unconstitutional on the facts of a particular case or to a particular party. By raising an as-applied challenge to the statute as charged in these counts, the defendant is asserting both by complying with the statute in the instance charged in these counts would have required her to incriminate herself and that this application of the statute violates her Fifth Amendment right. Having addressed the latter, a legal matter, above, let us stick with the former, a factual matter, for a moment. To assert that complying with the statute in the instances charged in these counts would have required her to incrimin incriminate herself is necessarily to admit the material facts that these counts charged her with concealing are true, i.e., that on the night of October 4, 2022, she did use controlled substances, and that in the early morning hours of October 5, 2022, she did travel to Azalea Mobile Home Plaza and discard Quentin's body into a dumpster, counts 10, 14, and 7, 17. Her sole grievances is, is with the constitutionality of penalizing her for concealing them, but to challenge the constitutionality of penalizing her for concealing them. She first must necessarily assert, or is it to concede, the factual premises that what are alleged in these counts as material facts are the truth, else she cannot assert, else she cannot assert that compliance with the statute in these instances would have required self-incrimination which is a threshold requirement as her as-applied challenge, for there can be no self-incrimination without the incriminating facts, which is, that's true. Like she would not be incriminating herself or admitting to a crime if she didn't really, you know, commit the crime. She could not admit to the crime and incriminate herself. If the defendant claims not to be making this admission, the state does not see how an as-applied challenge can be as much as get off the ground. And on its face, the defendant's filing does not appear to make its very admission in that it repeatedly refers to these facts as material facts. Emphasis added. With no qualification of the term, the state therefore notifies the defendant that it may consider this filing. If it is not withdrawn as an admission to the truth of these two material facts, C. Flint versus State. It is well established that a party in a criminal proceeding may make admissions in judiso and pleadings, motions, and briefs. Put another way, the state is unaware of any authority or the notion that the, that the defendant may merely assume arguendo the facts forming the basis for an as applied challenge. Dismissing well, Henderson versus McMurray dismissing an as-applied constitutional challenge in part because complaint failed to allege facts to support their challenge. Emphasis added. Certificate of service. So it was served July 14th. And that is it. Uh, so it seems like Okay, so first off, just the thought of what Quentin had to go through and them spelling it out. Um, I think that's something very important that, for the jury to hear as well. Them lay it out. You know what? I might would even do like a presentation to, I don't know, like hire a dumpster truck, throw trash in it, have it smushed, 
record it just to present that at trial to see like she had i mean i know leilani can't be the sharpest tool in the shed but she disposed of her kid in a way that really it makes me wonder if she did take this into account like he'll be taken to the landfill they'll never find his body it seems like i remember that being said like one of her brothers or somebody opened the door saying if he's in the landfill they're never gonna find him anyways and I'm like, well, let's keep our fingers crossed. But it seems like that was something she knew. Right, wrong is wrong. She knew better. Exactly. Um, did this video start with a commercial? I'm trying to find out how to fix it. I cannot figure out how to fix it. So I might do countdowns. Um, Yeah, you guys don't ever think y'all have to be members. I mean, I appreciate anybody that even watches, thumbs up, leaves a comment, hangs out with us. You definitely don't have to be a member. I appreciate everybody. Um, get that to your answer. Okay, thank you. Okay. But it also seems like she is saying, maybe I should put my intro at the beginning. Um, I'll try to do that. I'm going to try to start out with the intro because... Usually I open it, I'm like, this is what we're going to talk about today, and then I do the intro, but maybe we'll just try the intro first. That's what we'll do in the next video, try the intro first. You guys let me know how it works. If as soon as I go live, roll the intro, or talk for a minute, then roll the intro. I'm going to rely on you guys to give me the feedback on what to do. Um, so, it seems like she is saying, or they are saying, listen, she has this Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate herself. But you guys talked to her, so she had to lie, or else she would have incriminated herself. So you guys violated her Fifth Amendment right to not, not self-incriminate. And they're saying, well, if she wouldn't have done it, she wouldn't have to incriminate herself. She's basically admitting guilt by saying, well, I had to lie, or I would have incriminated myself. You know what I'm saying? Makes sense. Um, but anyways, just reading through that about what his body went through, and for them to say from jump, he was dumped, compacted, brought to the landfill, pushed around, steamrolled, and that he wasn't even found. His right, you know, well, his remains were not found intact. It was a piece here, a piece there, a piece here. And they collectively found as much as they could. Um it's a sad situation. It is a sad situation. So not, not much happened at her court date today. Um, these documents came out today. Well, they were filed on the 14th, but I just found out about them today. So I wanted to go over them. Um, but the judge is not going to make a ruling on those, the motions that the defense made until later on. When she does, I'll be sure to let you guys know. But that's kind of the update right now, you guys. She went to court. She showed up. Glasses. Um, you know, jail attire. A mask on. I think it said Billy Joe was there. I think Billy Joe was in the courtroom. But I'm going to continue to cover this. Any information that comes out, I'll make sure to let you guys know. Yes. Team Mom 2 um, premiered Tuesday night, and I watched both. There was two episodes, and I watched both, but I did get to take notes. So I'll try to do that tonight. I'll try to do the notes tonight, and um, because I don't want to go off memory. Uh, I kind of need to do it tonight. Uh, there were some interesting things that was happening there. But anyways, you guys have your thoughts in the comment section below. We're going to be live over on LB in just a little bit to talk about Maddie Goslin and her response 
to the documentary that just came out back to the 2000s, which is where John, Hannah, and Colin all talked about their experience with the show. Colin, his experience with being sent off to a psychiatric facility under the guise that he was, um, what did Kate say about him? He was like special needs. He was special needs. Um, not seeing any visitors for the entire time that he was there. Um, and then that calling out to his dad and his dad coming and saving him and what their life has been like since, how John had to fight for the two kids that he has now, how he doesn't have a relationship with the other children, but they do hope that at some point that can get better. We're going to be live over there. Maddie has responded, basically saying, I don't want Colin in my life and this is why. And a lot of people are like, girl, no, no, he was a baby. You should have. Uh, you should forgive him, you know. Um, I linked the video on my video. So the video that I did about Colin and Hannah and John, in the description box, I linked it. If you click on it, it'll take you right to it, and you can watch it for free. Um, it's about a 40, it's 44 minutes and 11 seconds, I do believe. So you can watch it. But we're going to talk about Maddie's response and how people are not buying her response. You guys leave me your thoughts. Please consider, to, um, please consider subscribing to this channel if you want to keep up with the Quentin Simon story. Anything that comes out, I'll be sure to do an update. I saw that, um, but I don't know if I believe that, Jay Marie. I don't, I don't know if I believe that. Give this video a thumbs up. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm. And I will see you guys over on LB shortly. Goodbye, everyone.